Hello everybody, I am Kelsey Mantoni, UMass Med Class of 2018, and you are watching a very special student episode of the 12 Days in March Step 1 video series. This presentation will cover the often overwhelming topic of ovarian tumors. This topic can be intimidating due to the sheer number of tumors, but each tumor really has one or two distinguishing factors that sets it apart. Being able to distinguish between these tumors can lead to quick points on test day. We will start our discussion with this amazing rendition of an ovary to help us make a broad outline of where these tumors can originate. The ovary is made up of epithelial cells, sex cord cells, germ cells, and finally we will touch on one key metastatic tumor. Now that we have our broad outline, we can organize all the tumors we will need to know, starting with the most common epithelial tumors. These include serous cisadenocarcinoma and mucinous cisadenocarcinoma. It also includes the much less common and much less commonly tested Brenner and endometrioid tumors. We will briefly cover these two tumors, but please don't devote a lot of test studying to them. The germ cell tumors include dysgerminomas, yolk sac tumors, choriocarcinoma, teratoma, and embryonal. Sex cord tumors include granulosa cell tumors and Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Even though these cells are more commonly seen in the testicle and testicular cancers, they can cause ovarian tumors too. Rounding out our tumors include the metastatic Kruckenberg tumor. So I know that sounds like a lot, and how the heck are we going to tell them apart? Well, we're going to do that first by who is the patient in the question sem. This is rarely a distinguishing feature, but it can give you a big clue. And number one, we're going to base it on histology. As with most tumors, this is really where the money is. Other distinguishing features can be gross appearance, tumor markers, or physiology. So what will a typical question look like? It will start with the age of the patient, as usual, but this can really help you narrow down your tumor, so pay attention to it. Then it will go on to describe some signs and symptoms. Could be fullness, pelvic pain, constitutional symptoms, but these symptoms generally aren't key because they will almost always then give you that they found an adnexal mass on exam. There is one caveat to this that we'll touch on later with sex cord tumors. Then they'll give you some pathologic description and expect you to either make the diagnosis or take it one step further and ask about a tumor marker. And that's it. There is really no creative way for them to come at you with this topic. Just two quick points. One is that almost all of these tumors can be bilateral, so don't be thrown if they tell you there are multiple adnexal masses. This is also a place where they love to incorporate anatomy. So one question is, what is the ligament that holds the vessels going to the ovary? And that is the suspensory ligament of the ovary or the unfundibulopelvic ligament. A mass in the ovary can cause torsion about this ligament and cut off blood supply. So here we go. Let's dive into the epithelial tumors. The four epithelial tumors are serous cystadenocarcinoma, mucinous cystadenocarcinoma, Brenner tumor. Really focus on the serous and mucinous. So serous and mucinous tumors, who gets these tumors? The patient will most likely be a postmenopausal female or a younger female with a strong family history. This is because BRCA mutations and Lynch syndrome puts people at much higher risk, specifically for epithelial tumors. Because these tumors result from repeated damage to the epithelial surface, anything that decreases the number of ovulations in a woman's life is protective, such as OCPs or multiparity. So now to the money, the pathology. These tumors are going to be cysts lined with epithelial cells filled with either a clear fluid or a mucus, as the name suggests. The histology can also help you determine benign versus malignant tumors. Benign tumors will have a simple layer of epithelium, while malignant tumors will be described as having papillary projections or a shaggy appearance. The final histological point is that serous cisadenocarcinoma is associated with somoma bodies. So let's take a quick detour to remind ourselves about somoma bodies. It would be great if on test day they said, a tumor with somoma bodies, but the boards will rarely be so forward. Instead, they will describe somoma bodies as dystrophic calcifications or calcific layered spherules. They will show you a picture like the one shown here. So make sure you can identify these images because they will come up in many different tumors. So remind me, what are the different tumors that have somoma bodies? If you said mesothelioma, meningioma, and papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, you got it. Last important thing about these tumors is the tumor marker. These tumors secrete a marker known as CA125. Now, as with most tumor markers, this is not diagnostic and should not be used for primary diagnosis. But it is a great way to measure responses to treatment and relapse. And that's how they're going to test you on CA125. Now for the last two epithelial tumors. There is really a couple things I want you to know about these tumors. First is that Brenner tumors look like transitional epithelial seen in the bladder. And for endometrioid tumors, they appear like endometrial tissue 
with glands and stroma. If there is an endometrial ovarian tumor, it's very often associated with lesions in the endometrium. So make sure you're checking that too. So there we have it. The most common ovarian tumors are done. You will have a postmenopausal woman with either an epithelial line cyst of clear fluid with somoma bodies, or an epithelial line cyst full of mucus, or a cyst lined with bladder epithelium, or endometrial-like tissue in the ovary with additional tumor in the uterus. So let's move on to the germ cell tumors. There are five types of germ cell tumors. Dysgerminoma, yolk sac, choriocarcinoma, teratoma, and embryonal. I can feel you getting a little hesitant by the sheer number of tumors we've already mentioned, but stick with me and I will focus on just the distinguishing features that are going to allow you to quickly separate these on test day. If you can see a theme here, it's that distinguishing features for ovarian tumors are most often histology. Yolk sac tumors have Schiller-Duval bodies, dysgerminomas look like fried eggs, teratomas will have multiple cell types in one image, and choriocarcinomas will have cyto- and syncytotrophoblasts. Embryonal tumors are not specific, and testing, especially about histology, will be very difficult. Dysgerminomas are the most common malignant germ cell tumor. These share a lot of features with testicular germ cell tumors, so learning these features will double its value. Germ cell tumors, in contrast to epithelial tumors, are a tumor of young premenopausal women, even children and adolescents. Histology, as we mentioned, look like fried eggs. This will be described as large cells with clear cytoplasm and large nuclei. I can definitely see the resemblance. And last to know for these tumors is that they secrete a lot of markers. The most distinguishing and most tested is placental-like alkaline phosphatase. But also be aware that these tumors secrete beta-HCG and LDH. So moving from fried eggs to yolk sac tumors, also known as endodermal sinus tumors. So who gets yolk sac tumors is very similar in demographic to dysgerminomas, but in question stems, it will almost always be a young child. They will always give you the pathologic description, and almost always with this key buzzword. Yolk sac tumors or endodermosinus tumors form Schiller-Duval bodies, or clusters of cells surrounding eosinophilic material resembling primitive glomeruli. And I'm going to repeat that, primitive glomeruli. Remember that it will be in the question stem. If you see this, it's a yolk sac tumor. Because these tumors have such a distinguishing feature, test makers will likely want you to take it one step further and know what the tumor marker is for this tumor, and that is alpha fetoprotein. Can you remember another tumor that is known to secrete alpha fetoprotein? That's right, hepatocellular carcinoma. Now let's break up these germ cell tumors with a question. So here we have a postmenopausal woman coming to the physician with some pelvic pain and urinary urgency and the exam is done and masses are felt on both ovaries. Ultrasound shows some cystic masses containing a clear fluid. The wall of the cyst has multiple outgrowths, making it have a shaggy appearance. And they want you to know what is the diagnosis. So let's break this down. First, we have some pretty nonspecific symptoms. Then they give you that there's masses on both ovaries. So remember what I said before in that any of these tumors can be bilateral, so don't be tripped up if they tell you multiple tumors. Now we go on to the description being a cystic mass with clear fluid, which should already have your gears turning. And the wall of the cyst has multiple outgrowth and a shaggy appearance. So clear fluid should point you towards serous. And this shaggy appearance should make you be thinking malignancy. So the diagnosis is serous cystadenocarcinoma. If they had said this wall of this cyst is flat and has a single layer of cells, we could have said serous cystadenoma. Now let's round out all the germ cell tumors with teratomas, choriocarcinoma, and embryonal. Teratomas are a very commonly tested tumor. They know students tend to be very familiar with what a teratoma is, so they tend to attack, you guessed it, histology. Being able to recognize a histology image of a teratoma can be very beneficial on test day. Teratomas are tumors that contain germ cells that have differentiated down more than one germ cell layer. So teratomas come in two flavors, mature and immature. Being able to distinguish between the two isn't likely going to be focused on, but it is important to know due to clinical differences. Mature teratomas contain well-differentiated cells, while immature teratomas contain poorly differentiated cells. This is important because mature teratomas tend to be benign, and immature teratomas tend to be malignant. So let's focus on the histology. Here is an example showing multiple cell types. It would be beneficial for you to Google or look up in text images teratomas to get a feel for what these images look like. They will not all be the same, 
and you need to be able to spot the key cell types, like keratinizing squamous cells, hair follicles, glands, cartilage, and even muscle or nervous tissue. Two other quick things to know about teratomas is that mature teratomas can have malignant transformation. The most common of this is squamous cell carcinoma. Yes, your tumor can get a tumor. Another rare presentation, but easily distinguishable, aka easily tested, is a teratoma that contains mostly mature thyroid tumor, known as a struma ovary. So if you hear adnexal mass plus signs of hyperthyroidism, think teratoma. The last germ cell tumor we'll talk about is choriocarcinoma. There is also embryonal carcinoma, but this is very rare and has very few distinguishing features, making it very difficult for test takers to attack. So choriocarcinoma. Once again, germ cell tumors are a tumor of premenopausal or young women. These tumors stem from placental-like tissue, and on image or in question stem, will contain syncytotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts. So what does a placenta usually secrete? Right, HCG. And choriocarcinoma is no exception. This is used as a tumor marker. Because these cells are programmed to invade blood vessels, they are often very small tumors that metastasize through the blood early. And we did it, germ cell tumors. If you need some buzzwords, refer back to this slide. Yolk sac tumors primitive glomeruli, dysgerminoma, fried egg, teratoma, multiple cell types, and choriocarcinoma, trophoblasts. Well, we're getting there. Now on to the sex cord tumors, with really only two main ones to know. The good thing is the questions about sex cord tumors will give you a lot of clues as to what they're talking about. Remember when I said for a small subset of these tumors, physiology will be important? Well, we finally got there. Sex cord tumors secrete hormones that can be a big giveaway come test day. The two tumors are granulosa cell tumors and sertoli Leydig tumors. I know you're thinking, sertoli Leydig cells, those are found in the testicles, not ovaries. Well, for tumors, they can be an important ovarian or testicular tumor. There will also be some key paths to know for these tumors, as always. For granulosa cells, these are called Cal Exner bodies. And for sertoli Leydig tumors, they will be Renke crystals. So granulosa cell tumors. Who gets these tumors? Mostly perimenopausal women, but on step one it can really be anyone, so the age of the patient really isn't a big clue. What will be a big clue is the histology. Cal Exner bodies will be seen, which are cuboidal cells in a multifollicular pattern around eosinophilic material. Knowing that image and knowing this description will be a big giveaway. Also on histology you can see groove nuclei, or what's described as coffee bean shaped nuclei. Grossly, these tumors will appear yellow because granulosa and theco cells are full of lipids. The tumor markers in physiology are really tied together. So tumor markers for the granulosa cells are estrogen and inhibin. So physiologically, you'll see signs of excess estrogen and inhibin. These patients will be either postmenopausal women with postmenopausal bleeding or young women with precocious puberty. Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. So histologically, these will appear as hollow or solid tubes surrounded by Sertoli cells. Gross appearance will be very similar to granulosa theca cell tumors with a gross yellow appearance because Leydig cells are also full of lipids. Now again, the tumor markers in physiology are tied together because Sertoli Leydig cells secrete androgens. So physiologically, these patients will show signs of excess androgens. So virilization, including hair growth, voice deepening, even acne. Let's do another practice question. So here we have a postmenopausal female presenting to her physician with some postmenopausal bleeding. On ultrasound, she is found to have a solid mass in her right adnexa. The gross appearance of the mass is yellow and firm. They also give you the pathology, which shows cuboidal cells in a multifollicular pattern around eosinophilic material. So now they want to know what is secreted by the tumor. So let's pull out the important information. For this tumor, the physiology and the symptoms is important. So we have a postmenopausal woman with some postmenopausal irregular bleeding. They also give you the gross yellow and firm, which is a clue, and pathology, which pretty much seals the deal with description of the Cal Exner bodies. So which of the following is the tumor marker for a granulosa cell tumor? And that's right, that's B, estrogen. All right, last but not least is a very popularly tested metastatic tumor of the ovary. This is known as a Kruckenberg tumor. Kruckenberg tumor is generally a GI adenocarcinoma, most commonly diffuse gastric carcinoma, that metastasizes to the ovary. 
Going back to GI briefly, this diffuse gastric carcinoma causes diffuse thickening and a leathery texture to the stomach wall. The pathology of this tumor is very classic and you won't want to miss it. Students know signet ring cells, but what you'll want to be able to do is recognize the description of a signet ring cell. And this is mucin droplets displacing the nucleus. Okay, congratulations, you did it. You made it through all the ovarian tumors you'll need to know for step one. So what are our broad topics? Epithelial tumors, germ cell tumors, sex cord tumors, and metastatic tumors. Now if you can go back and fill in the tumors you need to know under these topics with who gets them, what's their pathologic description, what's their gross appearance, any tumor markers, or any important physiology, and you'll be able to get every question presented to you on step one. If you have any questions on ovarian tumors, feel free to contact 12daysinmarch.com, and good luck.